What defines life? Here's an interesting question. Can we distinguish between what is living and what is dead, based solely on atoms or chemicals? Are there specific elements, atoms or chemicals, present only in living things? Well, not really. And as we'll see in this video, what enables us to distinguish between what is living and what is dead are the interactions between these chemical elements and their relative abundance. There are about 90 elements that are found in living things. If we look at the periodic table of elements, we can see 10 elements highlighted here in green. These are considered the major elements found in living organisms. These elements combine in different ways to produce a large number of biomolecules that are the building blocks of life, which vary in structure, complexity and size. There are a further 12 elements, shown here in orange, that are found in trace amounts in living organisms, but they are considered essential for life and have important functional roles in the organisms. Although many other elements may be present in living things, they are not considered essential for life. By far the most common elements present in living organisms are oxygen, carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. And these make up more than 95% of the mass of the human body. The reason oxygen and hydrogen are so abundant is the essential role that water, made up of one molecule of oxygen and two molecules of hydrogen, plays in allowing life to exist. If we contrast this to the Earth's crust, which is non-living, we see that carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen are present in only trace amounts, while oxygen, silicon, iron and aluminium are the major components of the crust. It's fair to say that the building blocks of life are carbon. With the exception of water, almost all biomolecules are carbon-based. In fact, if you are able to remove all the water from the human body, a majority of the remaining mass would be carbon. Using one atom for multiple purposes is extremely efficient for the body and carbon is a remarkably versatile element which is able to produce molecules in many different shapes with different geometry, including linear and branched chains, through to cyclic structures. Importantly, the functional diversity of biomolecules is underpinned by this structural diversity of carbon. So how does carbon achieve this diversity? Well, let's take a look at a carbon atom to find out. Carbon is made up of six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. It is these six electrons and the way that they are arranged in atomic orbitals around the central nucleus that gives carbon its versatility. The six electrons in carbon are distributed around the nucleus in atomic orbitals, which have specific shapes. The first two orbitals, which both contain a pair of electrons, are called 1s and 2s and they have a spherical shape, with the 2s orbital being further away from the nucleus. In addition, carbon also has three p orbitals, called 2px, 2py and 2pz, which take on a barbell-shaped structure along the x, y and z axes. The remaining two electrons are unpaired and occupy the 2px and 2py orbitals. This leaves the 2pz orbital unoccupied. Covalent bonds between two atoms can be formed when an atomic orbital from each atom containing a single unpaired electron combine to form a molecular orbital, with one atom contributing one electron to the resultant pair. Looking at carbon, you might expect that it could only form two covalent bonds, based on the presence of two unpaired electrons. But you might have already noticed that in fact carbon is capable of forming more than two bonds. For example, in methane shown here, one carbon atom has formed four bonds with hydrogen atoms. How is this possible? One of the electrons from the 2s orbital is promoted to the 2pz orbital, generating four unpaired electrons, one in the 2s, and one in each of the three 2p orbitals. This, in theory, 
allows carbon to form the four covalent bonds found in methane. However, the four covalent bonds would not all be the same, as they are made from different orbitals. If this were the case, the methane molecule would be incredibly unstable. So, promoting one electron on its own is not sufficient. In addition, a process called hybridization occurs, where the characteristics of the four unpaired electrons become equivalent. These hybrid orbitals are called sp3 orbitals and take on 25% of the 2s orbital characteristics and 75% of the 2p orbital characteristics. In this diagram, carbon's four sp3 orbitals are shown, which make up the four covalent bonds required to produce a molecule of methane. The four orbitals arrange themselves in space such that they are as far apart from one another as possible. Each of the sp3 hybrid orbitals fuses with the s orbital of a hydrogen atom forming four identical bonds, with a bond angle between each of 109.5 degrees. The carbon essentially sits right at the centre of a tetrahedron shape. OK, so we've had a look at how a carbon atom can form four bonds, but what about when it only forms three bonds? In the example given here of ethylene, which is a gas used to induce the ripening of fruit, each carbon formed only three bonds, two with hydrogen and one with the other carbon. Therefore, a different type of hybridization needs to occur in this scenario. Once again, one electron is promoted to the 2pz orbital, but only three hybrid orbitals are created, known as sp2 orbitals. Each of these sp2 orbitals takes on 33% of the s orbital properties and 67% of the p orbital properties. As before, these sp2 orbitals arrange themselves to create the maximum amount of distance between themselves, this time taking on a flat or planar triangular configuration with a 120 degree angle between the orbitals. There is, of course, the unpaired electron in the 2pz orbital and this aligns itself perpendicular to the plane of the three hybrid orbitals. To form ethylene, two of these triangular structures come together. One of the sp2 orbitals from each carbon combines head to head to form a sigma covalent bond, while the two pz orbitals overlap to form a different type of covalent bond called a pi bond between the two carbons. The pi bond occupies a ring-shaped structure between the two carbons, as shown in the diagram. The two carbons in ethylene are therefore linked by two covalent bonds, one sigma and one pi, and this combination is known as the double bond. The four remaining sp2 orbitals combine with the 1s orbital of hydrogen, resulting in the formation of four carbon-to-hydrogen bonds. In the final bonding scenario for carbon, it can bind to two other atoms. Again, an electron is promoted to the empty 2pz orbital, but this time only two hybrid orbitals are formed, called sp orbitals, which share 50% of the s and p orbital characteristics. They occupy a linear shape, with the orbitals 180 degrees apart from one another. The unpaired electrons of the 2py and 2pz orbitals occupy spaces that are perpendicular to this linear structure. When two of these linear structures combine, one of the sp orbitals overlaps head to head to form a sigma covalent bond, while the 2py and 2pz orbital pairs overlap sideways to form two ring like pi covalent bonds in the y and x axes. Therefore, the two carbons are connected by a triple bond. The three sp orbitals fuse with the 1s orbital of hydrogen atoms, forming two carbon to hydrogen bonds. The resultant molecule is acetylene, which is a highly flammable molecule due to the instability of the triple bond, and can be used in welding due to the high temperature of the flame produced. So, why carbon? Well, if we revisit the periodic table again, 
we can see that the nearest related element is silicon, which is also able to form up to four covalent bonds. So why is carbon the preferred building block, given that silicon is far more plentiful in the Earth's crust? The answer is largely due to the properties of the bonds formed. Carbon to carbon bonds are much stronger than silicon to silicon bonds, which not only helps in the construction of large stable biomolecules, but also releases greater amounts of energy when the carbon to carbon bonds are broken, which are taken advantage of for fuel purposes. When considering the energy needed to break bonds, we can also touch on the properties of different bonds that affect the geometry, stability or reactivity of molecules. There are three main properties that we need to consider. First, we're going to look at bond lengths. As you can see in the table, bonds between different atoms vary in length. A carbon to carbon double bond is shorter than a carbon to carbon single bond, while the bond between oxygen and hydrogen is shorter still. Therefore, the geometric shape of a molecule is determined by the atomic composition and the presence of single or double bonds. The next property is bond strength, or how much energy needs to be provided to break a bond apart. The strength of a carbon-carbon double bond, as you might predict, is higher than that of a carbon-carbon single bond, but it is not twice as strong, which tells us that the pi covalent bond is slightly weaker than the sigma covalent bond. The presence of this pi bond increases the reactivity of a molecule containing a double bond as it is slightly easier to break apart. The third and final characteristic is electronegativity. In any covalent bond involving two different atoms, one of the atoms has a stronger pull on the electrons. This property is called electronegativity, and the difference between the electronegativities determines the relative position of the electrons in the molecular orbit between the two atoms. This property becomes important when considering the ability of molecules to either receive or donate electrons during chemical reactions. In this video we have learned about some of the essential elements required for life, in particular carbon, and how its ability to form different numbers of bonds allows for the creation of a wider variety of biomolecules with different shapes, sizes and reactivity. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, then please give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell icon so that you'll be notified of any new videos when they are released. If you have any questions about the content covered in this video, then please post them in the comments below and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. I hope to see you in the next video.